MAGA communists need to fundamentally understand that. And any person who calls themselves a communist needs to start acting like a communist and recognize this inter-ruling class, this inter-imperial conflict that is happening. Because until we understand the science that comes about by understanding Bonapartism and how it operates, we are not going to be in the position to ever gain political power in any real capacity. We have the same ability in this time to build an organization like the Bolsheviks, to build an organization like the Bolivarian Circles, to build some sort of political framework aligned directly with the people, the people that are struggling, but also recognize this inter-imperial conflict. So as we move forward, we always must remember peace, prosperity, and the people's democracy. Nothing else will fundamentally break us out of this imperial crisis. We must recognize the time period we are in and operate on that basis. This is the Yankee Tank, signing out. And remember guys, if you want to defeat the wreckers, if you want to destroy the censorship coming from the top, make sure you follow me on Rumble and make sure you join my Telegram. It's a big deal to be able to destroy the censorship. And also remember this, if you like my content and you want to see more of the Yankee Tanky crushing my enemies, you will make sure that you send me a cash app contribution. You make this possible. Red Phoenix Rising, Yankee Tanky Rising. Now, spanking isn't just my deep, dark personal secret, it's America's deep, dark secret. A lot of them are self-hating, and there's a real worship of weakness in left-wing circles. Uh, you know, anything that is perceived of as weakness or, or disempowering, that's worshipped. And anything that is conceived of as strength, or showing pride in oneself, or building up one's strength, that's attacked. And that's said, well, that's fascist. You can't, you can't be like that. The first thing uh, that happens to young people when they, when they go to the university and they take gender studies, or race studies, or queer studies, is they're immediately told that, you know, that, that their identity, the way that they are as a person, is wrong. And they need to learn to hate themselves more. That's the message the left is giving young Americans. The roots of the patriotic socialist movement in the United States have their roots in the mistaken line of the CPUSA under Earl Browder during the 1940s. Browder, a revisionist, had aspirations to ideologically unite Marxism-Leninism with American patriotism. The uncanny and mismatched marriage of American settler nationalism with the internationalism of the communist movement did not work well for a myriad of reasons. Most importantly, because it sought to gloss over the inherent issues with upholding the United States as a settler colonial project and the implication that in order to be a communist, one must also be an American patriot. This confusing line was supported by numerous cherry-picked and out-of-context quotes from Stalin, and after Browder, many of these quotes, as well as quotes from Chairman Mao, are often cited to support this line. It must be stated that these various quotes are out of context and do not support the argument for American patriotism, but rather argue against it, should one have the intellectual honesty to investigate their context. In my Essentials of Maoism series, I will discuss the issues of settler nationalism in depth, but the important lesson here is that nationalism may either be revolutionary or reactionary, depending on the state for which this nationalism advocates. In decolonial or anti-imperialist projects, such as new democratic projects, there is proletarian patriotism which can serve as a positive revolutionary force. However, in settler colonial or imperialist countries, the nationalism which manifests in these countries assumes a settler chauvinist position, which ultimately reinforces the settler colonial project. To cherry pick quotes from the figureheads of Marxism and dogmatically apply their line out of context and without sufficient investigation is a specific type of revisionism, dogmato revisionism, which we will also cover in my series. To recap, dogmato revisionism is a form of 
dogmatism which seeks to rigidly and uncritically apply theory not derived from scientific investigation or the process of deriving true knowledge from practice but rather out of a quasi-religious adherence to the words of these various figures this dogmatism enshrines especially in this instance a mode of reactionary thought in the form of settler nationalism which debilitates the proletarian movement and therefore becomes a form of revisionism the dogmato revisionism of browderism continues to rear its ugly head and is best displayed in the center for political innovation cpi displaying the flag of the united states besides the soviet banner and the star-spangled banner in tandem with the internationale but we will discuss more about Caleb Maupin and the CPI shortly. LaRoucheism Perhaps the most overt example of fascism disguising itself as Marxism comes from the life and movement around Lyndon LaRouche. LaRouche, who finally died in 2019, was an eclectic far-right opportunist who led a cult of personality in his groups, the National Caucus of Labor Committees and the U.S. Labor Party. He and his followers initiated Operation Mop-Up, which sought to physically assault members of rival communist parties and organizations with batons, nunchucks, and other implements. You would think such actions would be universally condemned by all Marxists as a behavior resembling the actions of a Fed. However, you'll find that there are still apologists for LaRouche's Operation Mop-Up to this very day, including his most prominent disciple, Caleb Maupin. If his Fed work were not obvious enough, LaRouche and his followers would proceed to enter into a strategic alliance with the Ku Klux Klan, the white nationalist, neo-Confederate terrorist organization responsible for the widespread lynching and persecution of black people in the United States, especially in the South. LaRouche would also entrench himself in the Reagan administration and engage in all manner of far-right conspiracies. Unfortunately for everyone, LaRouche's ideas still circulate today rather than assume their proper place in the sewers where they belong. This is also where the conspiracy that environmentalism is a fascist plot comes from, a conspiracy so idiotic that it barely warrants a response. LaRouche and his followers promote industrial capitalism, ironically, without the understanding that industrial capitalism evolves into imperialism, while also framing any who seek to halt the expansion of industrialization as Malthusian degrowthers, a term which Maupin is fond of calling any and all of his detractors. It's almost like these LaRouche bags deliberately ignore the crisis of overproduction which Marx and Engels wrote about and think it's perfectly fine to encourage infinite growth in a world of finite resources and shill for big energy companies and other industrial enterprises to be granted the unfettered right to continue to destroy our planet's ecosystem. If it were not obvious enough with the alliance with the KKK, attacking other communists, working with Ronald Reagan, LaRouche was almost certainly a Fed, and therefore anyone promoting LaRouche thought or LaRouche successors such as the Schiller Institute should be treated with immediate suspicion. Duganism Alexander Dugan is a Russian nationalist and a far-right crank and his political works reflect the sort of ideological eclecticism we've come to expect from these far-right opportunists, who seek to disguise themselves and immerse themselves within any and all movements which will tolerate their presence. In this manner, Dugan has become a chameleon, and his ideas are finding fertile ground in this emergent patsock movement. Make no mistake, Dugan and his ilk are fascists, who only support from socialist projects seems to emerge from a mistaken adoration of the authoritarian aesthetic and certainly not from any Marxist logic. Dugan's daughter was recently killed in a bombing, an assassination plot, which is tragic only because Dugan himself was not the victim. Like all fascists, especially chameleon charlatan cranks like Dugan, they would be better off in such a state. And like LaRouche, any who promote Dugan thought 
ought to be treated with immediate suspicion and universal condemnation. Marxists, that is, true Marxists, have absolutely nothing to gain by engaging with the ideas of Dugan and LaRouche, if they can even be called ideas at all and not just crypto-fascist brain rot. Marxism, as a revolutionary science, already addresses the issue of contemporary class society in a manner which so vastly overshadows anything produced by Dugan, LaRouche, or any of their adherents that to even imply that Marxists can learn from such an intellectually and logically bankrupt fascist sludge is an error of such enormous magnitude that it warrants extreme admonishment and endless public ridicule from the Marxist community. Mock these fools, reject them, and shame them back into their basements and their sewers where they belong. The Issues of Reactionary Populism Many of these pseudo-Marxist hacks call themselves populists, and so we must discuss the fundamental error that populism provides. In order to do this, I'll provide an excerpt from my Essentials of Maoism series. The masses must be educated into socialism and the reactionary elements must not be tailed or catered to by the vanguard party, even if they constitute the majority of the working class under settler colonialism. This becomes the danger of populism because it can assume a form of reactionary tailism and lacks a class affiliation as a result. Populism becomes only aesthetically proletarian in form and reactionary petty bourgeois in function. Such populist opportunists will state that historically socialist revolutions have occurred as national liberation struggles, and therefore it has been an important tactic to embrace patriotism in these struggles, whether it is China, Korea, Vietnam, or other countries. However, when we speak of settler colonial countries within the imperial core, the patriotism slash nationalism which manifests there is of a universally different nature than the patriotism and nationalism within the imperialized, colonized world. Nationalism is a neutral concept. It is not inherently good or bad, neither revolutionary or counter-revolutionary by default. It is only by examining the particular circumstances of the country in question that we can derive whether its nationalism can serve the revolution. Settler colonial projects create a national identity which reinforces the colonization structure, which emphasizes the settler populace over the indigenous and enshrines settler chauvinism. This nationalism is a counter-revolutionary one which resists decolonization and self-determination for oppressed nationalities. By necessity, it rejects the socialist revolution, which will dismantle settler colonial relations. Therefore, settler nationalism can never be a revolutionary force and must be resisted and rejected by communists and replaced by a decolonial framework. Marxists who fail to challenge settler nationalism will enshrine its values within their movement. It will abandon the decolonial struggle and will reject the most advanced elements of the working class in favor of the most reactionary. The role of the vanguard party is to empower the advanced sectors of the working class and to educate and bring up the reactionary sectors. Until the reactionary sectors are educated into working class consciousness, they must be recognized and combated as a counter-revolutionary force. So what I'm attempting to explain here is that populism is a nebulous term which is divorced from a class analysis and quickly becomes co-opted by fascists who opportunistically wish to pass their bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology as proletarian. Populism, particularly within the American context, can only serve to tail the reactionary masses of the working class and appeal to the most backward and counter-revolutionary elements of American society. Therefore, populism becomes the enemy of the proletarian revolution and must be combated. Campism and False Imperialism To answer the issue of rampant campism intruding into the anti-imperialist movement, I'll provide another excerpt from my Essentials of Maoism series. Campism is the belief that the world is divided into a capitalist imperialist bloc and a socialist anti-imperialist bloc. 
the error in this assessment is the classification of countries which are advancing the capitalist project as anti-imperialist such as russia syria iran and belarus as marxists we understand that imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism and therefore a country advancing the capitalist project cannot be considered anti-imperialist even if these countries are oppressed by the primary imperialist bloc of the united states and western europe oppressed countries undergoing and advancing capitalism are merely lesser capitalist countries being oppressed by greater capitalist countries countries like russia who are imperialist in their own right are merely a lesser imperialist power in conflict with a greater imperialist power of the u.s and nato the marxist position should therefore be a principled opposition towards imperialism wherever it manifests whether it be a greater or lesser imperialism however this is not to say that marxists within the imperial corps should abandon their denouncement of u s nato imperialism but rather clarify their anti-imperialism as steered towards both greater and lesser imperialist powers Cheering for the victory of a lesser imperialist power's victory over U.S. NATO imperialism is a revisionist distortion of the anti-imperialist movement. Many of the supposed anti-imperialist countries cheered by Marxist-Leninists are actively attempting to advance their own native capitalism and construct rival imperial projects. Therefore, a principled Marxist would, instead, stand for the working classes of these countries and not for the governments of lesser imperialist or developing capitalist countries. Only by rejecting the capitalist project can a country be truly considered anti-imperialist from a Marxist perspective. The emphasis should be on supporting the working classes of countries involved in inter-imperialist conflicts, not the countries themselves. Class against class, rather than country against country. This is the line maintained by Lenin in his critique of the revisionist nationalism that dominated the Marxist movement during the First World War. So what I'm attempting to explain here is a tendency which is rife within the Patsock movement. Campism and a knee-jerk reaction to support any country which stands opposed to U.S. imperialism, regardless of the class features of such a country. The Patsocks go too far in their uncritical support for countries like Iran and Russia, and rather than supporting the working class involved in both sides of the inter-imperialist conflicts, they support rival and lesser imperialist camps. Ironically, calling themselves American patriots while supporting the enemies of the United States. The mental gymnastics required to push such a confused line is also demonstrable of the eclectic and shallow nature of their analysis. Marxists should wish for the defeat of all imperialist countries and all imperialist conflicts, and the desire for multipolarity is to desire the conditions which created the two world wars, because you know, that really worked out well the last time we had a multipolar world. The belief that so-called Marxists should support rival imperialist camps to thwart the primary imperialist bloc of the U.S. and NATO is so opposite of the revolutionary defeatism of Lenin that if Lenin were still alive, he would be giving these individuals the Romanov treatment. National Bolshevism. So why am I talking about this? Where does it all lead? It culminates in the formation of an ideology known as National Bolshevism, Nazbol for short. Nazbols are fascists who adopt the aesthetics of communism to disguise their fascism. They hide their fundamentally bourgeois ideology behind a thin veneer of pseudo-Marxist sounding rhetoric and empty lip service to Marxist figureheads while promoting a worldview which is fundamentally antithetical to Marxism as a revolutionary science. They inject the movement full of metaphysical garbage and idealist drivel, entirely divorced from dialectical materialism, and seek to parasitically infect the proletarian movement with their cancerous ideological sludge. Now, with all that background out of the way, who are the main perpetrators of Nazbol ideology in America today? Enemy number one is Caleb Maupin and his organization, the Center for Political Innovation, CPI. Caleb is a chameleon who has been on the scene for a long time, and I'm ashamed to say that in my early days on YouTube, I promoted and platformed Maupin because I mistakenly believed him to be a principled communist. Now, 
Let it be stated for the record as clearly as possible that I wholeheartedly denounce the Moppinites with every fiber of my being and every breath I can muster. Moppin is a threat because he knows the rhetoric of Marxism. He understands how to sound like a Marxist and how to speak with authority. But do not make the mistake I made and equate this rhetoric with a legitimate belief in Marxism. Caleb is the epitome of an ideological chameleon who changes his colors as often as he changes his suits. He promotes LaRoucheism and Duganism, immersing it with a reactionary populism and rampant settler nationalism. He's given uncritical interviews to a fascist named Cultured Thug, a turf named Jody Brar of the notoriously horrible Communist Party of Great Britain Marxist-Leninist, and appeared alongside Alexander Dugan and a myriad of fascists at a conference where Maupin ranted against identity politics and used bad right-wing arguments against the left that would be right at home on Fox News. He masks his revisionism and right opportunism behind a thin veneer of browderist rhetoric and pseudo-Marxist dogmato revisionism. He cites his movementist participation in Occupy Wall Street, his shout out from Nicolas Maduro, and his handshake from Daniel Ortega as credentials and uses these instances as a bludgeon to silence his opposition, who he universally asserts are CIA funded Malthusian degrowthers, ultra left, and radical liberal bread tubers, regardless of who is criticizing him. A knee-jerk default into baseless conspiracy theories, a wholehearted refusal to engage in criticism or self-criticism, and a slanderous attempt to enshrine himself as the only true Marxist in America today. His followers in the CPI dogmatically devote themselves to Maupin, and Caleb is fond of unleashing his followers on any and all detractors he has. In my personal experience, I tried to reach out to Maupin and constructively criticize his dissent, or rather his unveiling, into Nazbol-style rhetoric and his reactionary populism, summarized when he tried to equate the struggle for women's rights and LGBT rights as a culture war and not part of the class struggle. Needless to say, I'll be dedicating an entire episode of Essentials of Maoism to destroying this line of thought, but the short answer here is that right opportunist pseudo-Marxists will ignore identity politics and diminish it as a non-important culture war rather than recognize its rightful place within the class war. They will disregard the struggles of oppressed identities and falsely equate all identity politics to liberalism. This is emblematic of the privilege that some opportunist Marxists possess, and this is emblematic of the petty bourgeois reactionary tendency that is rife within the Maupinites. And I don't even have to get into the whole controversy around the spankings or the fact that CPI is a cult. I won't even touch that can of worms because, frankly, Maupin's views alone are enough to denounce him. The sex pestery and cultish behavior is only icing on the cake. Haas and the Infracells. Now we come to another specimen, ladies and gentlemen, Haas from the infrared community, or as I call them, Infracells, for reasons that will be made abundantly clear. But before I dive into the specific issues I have with Haas, we need to talk about the problems of debate bro culture itself. In short, debate bros are petty bourgeois individualists who engage in debate not to arrive at some sort of dialectic improvement or to test their ideas against an antithesis, but rather to pursue useless clout chasing and to dunk on their opponents to gain more personal fame, more clicks, and more idiotic fans. To that end, they become obsessed with procuring internet points ratioing their targets and bragging about their subscriber count and will rapidly descend into a number of bad faith sophistry ridden tactics ranging from juvenile name calling and personal attacks to a cringy machismo to outright misrepresentation and censorship. All of these are hallmarks of Haas and the Infracells who engage in these behaviors to an insane degree. It makes you wonder if these people ever go outside, if they 
ever leave their desks if they ever talk to another human being person to person. Outside of all the posturing and bloviating, his ideas and understanding of Marxist theory is devoid of all understanding and is polluted with metaphysics and LaRoucheism and Dugan brain rot. This allows Haas to come to conclusions such as organizing sucks and the US is already socialist. Clearly, the thoughts of someone who doesn't have the slightest idea of what he's talking about, and yet he manages to speak with such an inflated sense of authority that his equally idiotic followers gobble it all up and regurgitate these ideas to any who try to hold Haas to any level of intellectual standard. Now why do I call these people infracells? It is because Haas himself, whether he wants to admit it or not, is an incel. Even in the extreme unlikelihood that he's had sex, Haas presents himself as an incel in his mentality. He's extremely insecure in his masculinity, which leads him to engage in extremely cringy machismo posturing and petty insults to present himself as a testosterone-filled chad. This insecurity is plain for all to see and is not only painful to witness, but emerges as a toxic masculinity which attacks and belittles women, LGBT people, people of different body types, and people of different appearances, all of which serves to soothe his insecurities and the insecurities of his gaggle of idiots in the infracell community. So many people have asked me to debate Haas or Maupin. The answer I give is why. What possible good could it serve to debate individuals like Haas or Maupin, people so fundamentally divorced from engaging in good faith or behaving in an objective or constructive manner that engaging with them at all is a pointless exercise that can only serve to inflate their already massive egos and offer absolutely nothing to the movement. As I've explained, their ideas are antithetical to Marxism and completely void of any useful contributions to revolutionary science. Their understanding of Marxism is entirely lacking, and they only entertain Marxist rhetoric in an effort to mask their fascism as something proletarian and something revolutionary. And when they're confronted about these errors in a constructive, principled way, they rapidly descend into baseless conspiracy theories, bigoted and juvenile attacks, and all manner of brain-dead idiocy to appeal to their equally brain-dead followers. They prioritize in chasing clout and gaining fame in a petty bourgeois attempt to be the kings of their own little anthills while polluting the communist movement with their cancerous, parasitic, and fascistic slime that they call ideas. I could go outside and find a fresh dog turd and take a big ol' whiff and be more intellectually stimulated than engage with Maupin or Haas for even one second, and it would certainly be a better use of my time. Fascist and Nazbols shouldn't be debated. To debate them implies that their ideas are worth considering. The only reason to address them at all is to point out their myriad of errors and their vacuous nature of their existence. Hinkleberries and Right Opportunism Finally, the last subject of this video is Jackson Hinkle, and I'll just be very brief. A Bernie bro turned patriotic socialist who is the very embodiment of what I mean when I say ideological chameleon. This guy's only concern is chasing fame and gathering an audience for himself. He opportunistically brands himself as a patriotic socialist only to later drop the socialist suffix and go on the Tucker Carlson show, a Fox News fascist, and One America News, another fascist news network. And he argues that communism in America does not argue for the abolition of private property. <laughs> He argues for class collaboration against the George Soros liberal machine and argues for rampant industrialization to oppose degrowth, a clear nod to the LaRouche bags. So obviously, these pat socks are all cut from the same cloth. They all draw water from the same putrid well of Lyndon LaRouche, Alexander Dugan, and other Nazbol scum lords. And whether they call themselves patriotic socialist or proletarian patriots or MAGA communist or mecha tankies or 
any other number of cringy ass terms and labels, they all peddle the same crap. They all promote a junk pile assemblage of crypto fascism, settler nationalism, dogmato revisionism, and encase this in a toxic machismo, a cult of personality, and a clout chasing petty bourgeois individualism and disgusting bigotry. They believe that Donald Trump is a proletarian politician, despite the fact that Trump is part of the very same swamp he wants to drain. They swallow Trump's reactionary populist rhetoric hook, line, and sinker like the idiots they are and honestly believe this billionaire crook is going to empathize with the working class <laughs> and lead us to communism rather than use all of the useful idiots who follow him as a means to an end to sell crappy steaks and bad hats. They say that Trump is taking the fight to the neoliberals while not realizing that Trump himself is a neoliberal. Wake up, dipshits. Trump supports the uh, USMCA, an updated version of NAFTA, a free trade agreement, a neoliberal project. Trump is a capitalist, you absolute dumbasses. Just because he shook hands with Kim Jong-un doesn't mean that he's a Marxist. Next, you'll probably say that Nixon and Kissinger were Marxist because they met with Mao. Grow a brain. They also say that Trump is an anti-imperialist. Did all you idiots forget that he killed Qasem Soleimani and almost started a war with Iran? Did all of you idiots forget that he supported intervention in Syria? Did all of you idiots really forget all about how he threatened to wipe the DPRK off the map by saying he had a, a very big red button? And how he called Kim Jong-un Rocket Man on Twitter. It's almost like these Pat Sox live in their own little fantasy world. Maybe this is why no one takes them seriously. Not even the MAGA crowd. Everyone hates them. Hilariously enough, everyone hates them. MAGA hates them. Real communists hate them. And the only ones who seem to like them are idiots like themselves and literal neo-Nazis like Matthew Heimbach and Richard Spencer who attended rallies sponsored by the CPI and have recently joined in the Patsock grift. So that about does it. Let this be the end-all be-all of the anti-Patsock rhetoric. I'm tired of talking about these morons. I'm tired of dealing with these morons. Anyone who encounters them, refer them back to this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you on the next episode. Danky Kang out.